All right, it looks like we have started to level off a little bit. So let's go ahead and get started. My name is Gail Schwartz. I'm the Associate Director of Policy and Programs here at the Housing Alliance of Pennsylvania. The Housing Alliance is a statewide housing coalition working to increase access to safe, decent, and affordable homes for all Pennsylvanians. We work to fulfill our vision for a home within reach through state and federal policy advocacy, opportunities to connect, share, and learn from your peers, and events such as our annual Homes Within Reach conference. If you aren't a member, we ask that you consider joining. You can visit our website to join as a member, or you can contact us at info at housingalliancepa.org for more information. Today's webinar will run approximately 60 minutes, including questions and answers. If you want to ask the presenters a question, please use the Q&A function. The chat function uh, we ask uh, to be reserved for asking Housing Alliance logistical questions about the webinar. Again, please use the Q&A feature for questions for the presenters. We will email you a recording of this presentation and any associated materials with it in about a week's time. And please don't forget to check out our uh, upcoming events. Our next event is going to be next Wednesday, the 18th, where uh, we are going to have a brief, brief information session on the Housing Alliance new nonpartisan voter registration, engagement, and education initiative. Uh, you can always register for all of our events at uh, the Housing Alliance events calendar on our website. Also, just to share with all of you folks, starting on July 1st, the Housing Alliance will revert to our practice of providing free webinars to paid members and charging non-members $25 per webinar for most webinars. And of course, please remember to save the date for our annual Homes Within Reach conference. It's going to be December 7th through the 9th. We'll be in Hershey, Pennsylvania again. Uh, with our conference, our theme is going to be uh, a stronger, more equitable tomorrow. And of course, we will continue to uh, work with the Hershey Lodge to follow all CDC and state guidelines uh, in time uh, at the conference. Next, we do want to just share some resources. Again, to learn more about eviction prevention, please be sure to check out our interactive uh, report on analysis of eviction filings. You can also see all of our resources that we've put out in regards to eviction prevention and stabilizing renter households on our special eviction prevention page. And uh, a good webinar to always check out is our webinar from last year. It was a two-part series on housing law. And of course, please check out our 2022 policy agenda. Now with that, it is time to get started with our webinar. So really uh, to get started, I just want to say a few opening words. Local leaders are struggling with what to do about the eviction crisis. Eviction completely disrupts tenants' lives and saddles them with a court record that can negatively impact their future housing opportunities for years to come. Landlords operate often operating on tight margins lose necessary income impacting their ability to meet their financial and operational obligations, including repairs and maintenance. However, the eviction aftermath is not just limited to tenants and landlords. It also negatively impacts employers, schools, social services, courts, neighborhoods, and more. When the pandemic started, the Housing Alliance switched its primary efforts to eviction prevention. We have been convening peer exchanges, providing guidance, and completing analysis of the range of eviction prevention efforts happening across the Commonwealth. In February, we released an analysis of eviction filings that included two case studies on court-based eviction prevention programs. 
Today, we are going to take a deeper dive into these programs to better understand the process for establishing programs within the courts that are able to balance the needs of tenants, landlords, and the community as a whole. First on our agenda, we are going to hear from Chi Hun Kim, Manager of Research and Education here at the Housing Alliance. He will review the two case studies we released and you all should have received last week. Then we are going to have a discussion with Jennifer Lopez and Don Smith, the two individuals responsible for getting the program started in their communities. With that, Chi Hun, I pass it over to you. Thank you, Yale. Uh, please bear with me for a moment as I share my screen. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Shihan Kim. I'm the uh, uh, research and education manager here at the Housing Alliance. And I'd like to um, just give you a quick uh, roadmap of the webinar. So I'll start off by talking about the basics of the eviction process, then give you a, an overview of the, the eviction diversion programs that um, we will uh, be discussing today, and an overview of what we know from eviction data about the impact of these programs. And then I'll hand it back over to Gail for uh, discussions with the administrators of the two programs. So um, this is just a quick roadmap of the eviction process in PA. I do want to you know, make a caveat that this is just a, a quick summary. And this, this process covers um, PA outside of Philadelphia. Uh, Philadelphia has a slightly different uh, process. And to also wanted to note that this covers um, what is called the formal eviction process. It happens through the courts, but will not cover uh, other kinds of displacement, sometimes um, put under the umbrella of informal evictions that do not involve um, the formal court process. So um, one of the most important points at the beginning is an actual eviction filing by the landlord made at the local magisterial district court. Um, this can happen with or without a previous notice to quit, which is a notice given to the tenant by the landlord that an eviction filing is imminent. Um, a notice to quit is generally required by uh, to be given out to the tenant before filing, but that requirement can be waived in the lease and it, it is indeed often waived in the leases. So after an eviction is filed, there is a record in court and a hearing is scheduled seven to 15 days from the date of filing. Uh, after a complaint is served to the tenant, which has to happen at least five days before the hearing, um, the, the hearing can take place. Um, prior to the hearing, though, the landlord can withdraw the case and parties can reach settlement um, before any judgment is rendered by the judge. So once the hearing happens, um, the judge uh, has some options. Um, they, the judge can find uh, enter judgment with the landlord or enter judgment with the tenant. They can also continue the case, which means that uh, any final judgment in the case is delayed until another hearing can happen or dismiss the case. Um, if the uh, case is found for the landlord, then the landlord is entitled to what is called an order of possession. This is kind of the legal order that enables the sheriff or the constable to take physical possession of the property. And that happens uh, as soon as 10 days after the judge uh, enters judgment for the landlord, unless there is an appeal. And once an order of possession has been served, uh, 10 days after that, the actual lockout can happen. Um, unless there has been some sort of judgment that has been paid by the um, tenant through the stay and pay process. So this is a fairly quick process can happen um, within a month. Um, and in fact, through our data, we find that if an order position is issued, that does tend to happen around the month after the filing of the case. Um, now, having said that, I want to kind of flip over to talking about the programs that we'll be discussing today. So um, for the first I'll be discussing is the uh, program in Chester County, which is called Eviction Prevention Court. Uh, this program started in September 2020 and is administrator, administered by the Friends Association, which um, I believe this year celebrates its 200th anniversary. Um, one thing that was uh, really important to um, the buildup of the program was uh, building relationship with stakeholders, including the courts. Um, one important requirement is an approval from the president judge of the county court system to start um, programs like this. 
So that was an important uh, in consideration for starting the program. It works with three participating magistral district judges, or at least it's, um, it started as three. Um, now, uh, number is two, just because there was a merger between two of the MDJs that were participating, but it covers the same area. Um, these judges cover some of the highest need areas in Chester County and see um, some of the highest uh, number of eviction filings in the county. Um, the program has many different prompts, but um, first, before the hearing, um, it works to contact tenants uh, with information about resources and the program that will be offered. And that is often done through um, shoe leather and the, uh, knocking on doors. Uh, at the he hearing, um, there is an attorney uh, present to give legal advice to tenants and a court coordinator uh, who provides intake, um, often done before the hearing date, and connections to rental systems as well as connections to the court system itself. The court coordinator performs this intake and works with the, the entire team, including the attorney and intern, and is the liaison with the court. Uh, the attorney is there to prevent, uh, provide tenant legal assistance and, nego and negotiate with the landlord for any settlements. And one important uh, facet of this program is uh, landlords having experienced how eviction prevention court works have also reached out prior to filing eviction cases to the program directly for assistance. And that is one important way in which the program is getting to the stage before filings are even filed. Oh, oh, before I get to the next stage, I want to set the stage for our uh, uh, data analysis. So we were interested in um, looking at uh, evaluating what uh, eviction cases look like in Pennsylvania. And so to do that, we obtained case data from the uh, Pennsylvania state court system. And one of the goals was to um, look at what was going on in these courts uh, that have been participating in the eviction, eviction diversion programs. So what we first looked at was the outcomes at, at, at or before the hearing. So whether the judge found that the landlord, the tenant, or, or whether the case was settled or withdrawn. And this is what we'll look at in the next slide. Um, let me walk you through it uh, bit by bit. So we're comparing uh, the courtrooms that are participating in eviction prevention court with other courtrooms that are uh, elsewhere in Chester County that are not participating at this point. So the uh, Bars that are highlighted in yellow are the current EPC participating judges and the bars that are in Navy or other court in Chester County. And so the chart is divided into two parts. Let me just focus on the top part, which is for 20, 2019 cases. So there, the one thing I want to draw your attention to is that the bars are fairly even across the board for plaintiff, judgments for plaintiff, defendant, withdrawn, settled. And those look similar regardless of whether the courts later participated in EPC or uh, later did not participate in EPC. And the vast majority of those cases were found for the plaintiff. Now I wanna draw your attention to the bottom half of the graph, which is court cases filed in 2021. There you see a really significant difference um, between the courtrooms that are participating in the program and courtrooms that are not, that we didn't see before the program was in effect in 2019. So judgment for plaintiff uh, went down by almost half. And uh, in, uh, in counterbalance to that, uh, cases that were withdrawn increased almost three times in the participating courts. And cases that were settled increased uh, 20 half times from 10% to 24% of all cases being settled in the participating courts. However, if you look at other courts in Chester County, um, even though things are very similar in 2019, um, they're very different in 2021. And for the those Navy bars, the bars look fairly similar between 2019 and 2021, even with the intervention of the pandemic and in, in, in between 2019 and 2021. I also want to show you what happened with orders of possession, which uh, just to remind you is kind of the, the last point before a legal eviction can happen. And in this uh, graph is uh, laid on the same way as the previous one. And before the program, the eviction prevention court program was in operation, basically all the courts in Chester County looked fairly the same with about 35 to 40% of the cases uh, resulting in an order of possession. But in 2021, 
um, the rate cut down significantly in the courts participating in eviction prevention court. And while the rate also decreased in other courts in Chester County, um, because there are a lot of other renter protections in place uh, in that in most of that year, the decline was uh, nowhere near as great as in the judges that participate in NEPC. And with that, I want to uh, introduce you to the other program that we'll be discussing today, which is uh, the one that operates in Berks County in the city of Reading. This program also started in 2020 um, in the courtroom of the Honorable Judge Tanya Butler. And uh, these connections were made through kind of community connections and serving on task forces and, and in Reading. And this is a partnership between uh, Mr. Smith, uh, who's here, um, city uh, Reading staff and Judge Butler. Um, one thing I wanted to draw your attention to is that that district, um, Reading is a city that has some of the highest eviction filing rates in the Commonwealth. And it's an uh, especially strong problem, important problem in Judge Walter's district. Um, and there are kind of community-wide effects that ripple out from uh, evictions being filed and evictions being executed. And that was one of the impetuses for this uh, program being started in that district. Um, Again, uh, as with the Chester County program, this uh, program covers a range of different activities. So uh, one important thing about this program is that there's a notice that goes out immediately, uh, automatically uh, when a case is filed. The notice of hearing that goes to the tenant uh, has a special form that's printed in different colored paper that includes information in both English and Spanish. And this tells the tenant exactly what is at stake, which is potential eviction. Um, that's not always made clear in the kind of legal lease language that goes out uh, uh, in most cases. And it gives tenants actionable information about which numbers to call, uh, which documents to bring to the day of court. And it tells them that legal assistance will be available prior to the hearing if they show up 30 minutes earlier. And that has been really important for uh, raising the uh, percentage of tenants who actually come to the hearings to be heard. Intake is provided through the city staff and the city of Reading uh, Anderson also provides some rental assistance uh, according uh, along with the county's uh, rental assistance program. And um, these efforts have really um, dramatically made uh, hearings more fair for the tenants and increased the number of tenants who uh, come to the hearings to be heard. And let me show you the same data that we saw for Chester County. Uh, only thing different here is that we've added a, another bar for programs uh, for, excuse me, judges in other parts of Reading. Um, and really this uh, the eviction problem is seen all over the city of Reading. But in this case, we also see differences emerge between uh, Judge Butler's courtroom, which participates in the eviction diversion program compared to other courts in Reading. So again, if you see uh, in 2019, that's the top half of the graph, we see that vast majority of cases were being found for the plaintiff, very little uh, other uh, dispositions. And that was similar, regardless of where you were in Brooks County. In 2021, though, if you look at the gold bar, which is the participating courtroom, judgments for plaintiff go way down and judgments for defendant go way up as well as cases that are withdrawn. And this is uh, uh, regardless of uh, it being in the city of Reading, because if you look at other courts in the same city, you see very little changes between 2019 and 2021. And the same story with orders of possession where they have really gone dramatically down in Judge Butler's courtroom, but only to a more moderate extent in other courts uh, within Buck, uh, Berks County, whether in Reading or not. So with that, um, I want to hand it back over to Gail for a uh, roundtable discussion with uh, Mr. Smith and Ms. Lopez. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for that overview of the programs and really being able to give us that visualization of the impact that they're having in the courts that they're working. So uh, now we get to the best part, which is, you know, the panel discussion. So uh, our first guest is Jennifer Lopez. Uh, Jennifer is the executive director at Friends Association, has been with the organization since 2019 and has over 30 years of experience in strategic and organizational management, focusing on transforming systems by creating, implementing, and improving programs for systems impacted individuals. 
Jennifer also provides training and is a featured speaker both locally and nationally on trauma, justice involved women and family homelessness. And then from the Burks program, we have Dawn Smith. Dawn is a graduate of the Dickinson School of Law and practiced law for 28 years with Weaver, Hyman and Potter in Reading and then served for 10 years as executive director of the Berks County Bar Association. Now retired, he volunteers to represent tenants facing eviction. So my first question to both, both of you, and Jennifer, I'll have you answer first, but can you briefly describe what the eviction process looked like for, for tenants before your program started? Sure, and I want to say thank you for having me and thank you for this robust evaluation that you did at our pro of our program. It has really helped us in continuing to forge forward um, and expanding the court and getting funding. Um, prior to our eviction court program, there are there were 17 district courts in Chester County. And so all running independently of one another, all uh, locally elected judges running the courts. Um, for the most part, evictions, um, landlord tenant hearings were held multiple days a week, depending on when a complaint was filed. So there was not one set day uh, in the courts. Tenants were less likely to show up. And I think in the courts that we are not, that are not participating currently, that, that still holds true. When we first met with Judge Baloki, where we started the court, he said about 70% of tenants just don't show up. And, and there are multiple reasons for that. Um, I think that they don't understand the proceedings, the language. I mean, you know, just going through it now, notice to quit. What does that mean? Um, order of possession. You know, when you look at the documents, you don't actually see the word eviction anywhere. So tenants are overwhelmed by the information, by the legalese within the filing and just figure it's a done deal. Um, some of our more rural courts um, have really low filings. Southern Chester County, where we see a large immigrant population, most of the time they'll get the notice to quit or the landlord will say they're filing and they just leave and it never really even makes it to court. Um, so we saw a lot of tenants being evicted. We saw a lot of tenants not showing up for court, not understanding their rights or knowing their rights around eviction. And we saw kind of just every day of the week, multiple times during the day, um, hearings taking place and uh, very few tenants being represented by legal counsel. Uh, our legal aid of Southeastern PA was doing some of the work, um, but really limited in their availability to get out there and represent tenants. And Don, uh, what were you tenants seeing uh, before your program started? You're muted. A lot of what Jennifer says uh, certainly applies to Berks County. Uh, as indicated, our program started in September of 2020, but uh, following my retirement uh, at the end of 2018, I uh, was fortunate to be provided with office space at uh, MidPen Legal Services, our legal aid provider here in Berks County. And then they actually, gave me training in landlord tenant law, which was an area of law that I had never practiced in before. So it got me into magisterial district courts prior to uh, the program, prior to the pandemic. And, and I have to agree that the, with regard to, of course there I'm representing them as a legal aid attorney. And I'm one of the, but in my experience, we never saw I never seen, and that continues to this day, a private attorney representing a tenant. Um, there's a, a study that was done in 2019 that uh, indicates that 90% of the landlords are represented by an attorney and only 10% uh, of the tenants are represented. I, in Berks County, I don't even, we, we rarely see a landlord represented by an attorney. Now uh, that may, we have a couple corporate landlords that will bring in an attorney, but other than that, uh, there's been no um, representation on either side. 
except uh, for legal aid attorneys that are available to represent tenants. But that's here in Berks County. Uh, we have a turnover in that office. It's been hit hard. Uh, and so tenants are uh, in large part clearly not being represented as, as Jennifer mentioned um, in Berks, in, in Chester County. Also the no-show rate. Uh, Judge Butler uh, told me the very first day we had hearings as part of the program, she said, gee whiz, uh, everyone had, every tenant had shown up that day. And she said that never happened before. It's at least a 50% no-show rate. And as Jennifer indicated, if, if you read Matthew Desmond's book on evicted that came out in 2016, that's true nationally, as high as 70% as they saw, as the one judge said in Chester County. And, and it's, it's because tenants can't get off work. If they, if they do have work, they don't want to leave work and risk losing a job, or they have child care issues, not able to find someone to watch the, watch the kids, or they simply, they don't understand the process. And like what's been indicated is how clearly defined as to what's what's at stake here or they're intimidated or they have this feeling of helplessness so that that was a problem before I also this my work um, is uh, with mid pen has was for the first time taking me into magisterial district courts in my 28 years of being a personal injury attorney I never went in I never tried a case in magisterial district court and and, and but now with my experience, and, and like, what, like in Chester County, we have 17 magis magisterial district courts in Berks County, five in the city of Reading. They don't get much, these judges don't get much guidance from, uh, from the president judge. They're, uh, they're in many ways on their own. And I, and I dare say, I, I don't know how much training they have. And, and so many of them, uh, are former police officers, so they know the criminal law, and I and I think they gravitate to the criminal side of magisterial district court uh, jurisdiction, where and they don't, they're not interested in more than pushing the cases, uh, uh, landlord tenant cases through the system. Like you would rarely see a continuance um, bef uh, before, and if and if the landlord wanted to amend the complaint. You got, you got, all right, he'll get, the experience was you have 15 minutes. I'll give you another 15 minutes to prepare. Not, not a continuance, which would be allowed under the rule. So uh, it, I, I found that to be very frustrating. In fact, we had one magisterial district judge that ignored the moratorium. And we had to go into court three times to get an emergency injunction to prevent uh, the constable locking them out. And and also after the pandemic hit, the parties, and this included the landlords, did not understand what rental assistance was available. It wasn't, you know, how do you get the word out when people don't read the newspaper anymore? And it, 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 so that was, uh, that was really frustrating, even when we received so much uh, rental assistance. Uh, so quite honestly, to sum it up, I think Matthew Desmond says, it's, says it best that when you don't have a lawyer, and landlord tenant court, you don't receive due process. You simply see mere process pushing the cases through. Yeah, that's very, very uh, telling. Uh, I'm wondering if you can go ahead and continue and I'll have Don you answer this question first about how your program is starting to impact and change that process as you see it. Well, as, uh, as it's been indicated, as part of the program that started uh, on the first, uh, in, in the, the beginning of September of 2020, uh, a special notice went out with the notice of hearing, along with the complaint. Uh, and that notice indicates, indicated uh, that you, there would be an attorney present in court to help you, and there would be a person also in court to help you with applying for rental assistance. And this notice indicated uh, what you had to bring. You know, believe it or not, they have to be told: bring your lease, bring any pay receipts, uh, as well as uh, the information needed for the application, proof of income, and uh, ID, and so forth. So it was, uh, and that we attribute that now to that special notice to the no-show rate really going 
uh, in Judge Butler's courtroom, it's it's been less than 10 percent uh, and which she found to be amazing. Um, the impact also, I believe, has has allowed for and to a greater degree due process to be shown in these cases um, with with the uh, what what we've done is that uh, I, I initially will uh, meet with the uh, tenant and find out what the complaint is alleging, review the complaint, uh, review, hopefully the tenant has brought the lease and it allows me to review uh, the lease as well. Um, the, um, and, and of course the role of the attorney is so vital. Uh, I, I've, I frequently have to object to hearsay evidence. I've in, interpreting the lease, I, I uh, if, you know, frequently, as, as has been indicated, the notice to quit requirement is waived, but it has to be a knowing waiver. And, and that means it has to be really clear uh, from the lease. And, and so I've actually been able to interpret and get judgments in our favor based on the lack of a proper notice, a proper knowing and waiver of it. Just as a quick, um, just a quick example, this one landlord claimed that a waiver had been uh, executed and I'm looking at the lease and I've never seen language like this. The, the language in that lease was that if you're more than 20 days late paying the rent, it's assumed you have noticed that I will be filing for your eviction. Well, that's not, you haven't indicated what the right is. And that can't be a knowing waiver if you haven't first been told what is your right to notice. So it's, it's uh, and the other issue that I've been able to help from just a, from a legal point of view, interpreting the lease is, is it really the ter end of the term of the lease? Because uh, frequently uh, what we were seeing, what we have been seeing is the tenant will say to me, oh no, I don't have a lease. Uh, um, I, it, I ran for one year, but then I never got a new lease, so I don't have a lease. And I'll say, well, could I see the old lease? Because obviously it's renewed, but did it renew for the 30, for 30 to, uh, month to month, which is frequently what the landlord will say. But if you, you need to look at the lease, does it really say that? Or did it actually say it would renew at the same term as the original one? And frequently that's, that is the case. So the value of having an attorney there has been proving immensely uh, but also having the rental assistance person there, taking the applications frequently for the first time or, uh, or explaining the process and, and because it can be overwhelming as to what's needed. Uh, so that's, that's where we've had the impact uh, as, as has been seen by the difference in the numbers from, from 2019 to, 2020, to uh, 2021. Thank you. And Jennifer, I pose the, the same question to you. What are you, what are the disruptions that you're seeing to the eviction process? Yeah, so I, I want to address first, um, we started in one district court and then after four months went to two others that then merged into one. And I will say our experience was a little different. We had very seasoned judges on the bench in those two district courts. And what we found is, um, and I, you know, them straddling the line of you know providing counsel like being on the bench hearing from the landlord when a tenant would show up kind of advising them of their rights which is they were struggling quite frankly um, because there were you know there are two struggling individuals at times a tenant a landlord and the judge is trying to come up with the best outcome for both parties and so we were able to step in and kind of take the burden off the court um, to have to negotiate and mediate and figure out, you know, what was going on. So, um, you know, we saw judges trying very hard to make sure that everyone's rights were protected um, and that they were making fair decisions in really difficult situations. Um, so in the courts that we're in, uh, the first thing that we discussed with the judges was uh, um, scheduling all landlord tenant matters on one day. Um, so it was, immensely helpful to be able to have our attorney and our coordinator on site uh, two days a week. When we were in the three courts, the two judges decided on one day. So we were in 
uh, in the city of Coatesville in the morning in one court, in the afternoon in the second court. Um, and they both you know, completely changed days and times for us and moved their schedule around. And then Judge Baloki in Downingtown on Thursdays. Um, initially, we were sending out notice with um, the notice to the tenant about the program, uh, but there are our local court system decided uh, that they didn't want us doing that any longer uh, because the landlord wasn't getting notice and there were just some challenges around that. And that really created a hiccup for us in the program uh, because there's not a lot of detailed information in the complaint. So we're not getting contact information for tenants. Um, so we were really relying on them getting that notice and calling us prior to court or showing up early day of court to get our intake process completed and figure out you know, what was happening with their case to really mount um, a discussion with the landlord. So we have had to shift to do a lot of outreach. Um, you know, as is seen in our data, you know, we're having a lot more settlements. We have a lot more tenants showing up to court. Um, word of mouth, we're dealing with um, landlords that are now familiar with the program. So they're actually having their tenants reach out to us uh, ahead of time, or at least showing up for court, um, agreeing to continuances so that we can figure things out. Um, so I think it really has changed the landscape in the two courts that we're in, um, in providing you know, the cooperation and collaboration and providing the information we need. We're supporting the courts, making the court more efficient. Um, you know, there are some delays. We, in April of 2021, we became a provider for emergency rental assistance. So that, was, that changed the game prior to that. You know, we would have to go through the process of evaluating. Um, we were using our own funds. We did fundraising to support paying off back rent. Um, I will say at that time, we were getting reductions in back rent uh, because you know, we had limited funding, uh, but we would have to come back, do a request, run it through. And we had just approved a policy to write checks day of court when ERAP happened. And so that delayed us, but you know, I was in court last week and you know, we brought in 10 checks with us and we're able to close the cases immediately, get the landlord to sign off on the withdrawal form um, and, you know, that's a, a huge benefit uh, that we've seen. And I think the court has seen in, you know, I, I think our judges erred on the side of caution in the past and would continue cases to allow the tenant to try to figure things out and work things out and really come back with no resolution. And now we're seeing the cases move through the court, even when there is a continuance, it's with support from our social service end of things to you know figure out what's happening and what services are needed or how we can best resolve the situation. Excellent, excellent. Now, my next question to you both, and we'll start with Jennifer, is um, I'm just wondering if you could do a deeper dive into you know what is the conversation with tenants as you're you're leading up to this program. Um, you know, they get the flyer, they get the notice, or you know, they get a referral from their landlord or a door knock from your, your team. So how does that conversation go? Well, typically it's our coordinator, uh, Ava King, who's uh, you know extraordinary in her ability to connect with people. Um, she's sometimes knocking on doors. Uh, we had one case that I always talk about. She was went to some woman's house, and the woman was standing on the porch, and she you know walked up and introduced herself, and the woman started crying, and she said, "You don't understand. Like I was just reading this notice and thinking, what am I going to do? Where am I going to go? And then you showed up." Um, so we explain uh, what our parameters are, you know, we look at what the case is. So Ava will, you know, ask for the lease, all the documents. We first screen for eligibility because we are looking at tenants that are 80% or below the area median income. And I will say most are less than 50% um, of the area median income. Uh, so we do that initial screening and then we talk through, it's a lot of listening. Um, we are finding a lot of of, uh, habitability issues. Oh, you know, there's there's so much tension sometimes by the time the complaint is filed. So we're kind of weeding through what's happening um, and what the past history has been. Have they talked to their landlord? You know, have there been conversations? Um, and then reviewing the lease. 
uh, and then day of court, we kind of, we hand that off to our attorney who's there. Ava also speaks with the landlord to figure out if there's a way, you know, is the landlord just like wants the person out and there's no negotiating or is there room? And I will say that nine times out of 10, most landlords will say, I don't want to evict, but I don't know what else to do. You know, I'm at this point where I, I can't continue doing this. Um, so we'll kind of have those discussions. Our, our lawyer really kind of takes a, you know, a step back to allow that process to organically happen and, you know, figure out what's happening. We do very few, um, you know, we might have 17 cases listed before the court on a day and the, the attorney's really only doing a hearing on one or two that we can't resolve. Um, and usually there's a voucher involved and we're trying to get information from the housing authority, which I will say, um, you know, they sometimes come to court with us so that we can get, you know, exactly what's happening. So it's really like cut down on the misinformation or misunderstanding of information between parties. Um, and then of course, we also have the rental assistance available. So we'll do applications for, for tenants that have not already applied right in the court. We have a person from our rent, uh, emergency rent assistance program in both courts taking applications. We also uh, worked with the county to make sure that every court gets a weekly list of evictions and who has applied for rent relief. There are five providers in the county uh, so they can see exactly who has made an application, what agency they're with. And then we liaise with those agencies to, to kind of help. And we've expanded, I mean, we're in those two courts, but we'll often uh, consult with other courts about what's happening, especially as it is uh, as it pertains to emergency rent relief. So every tenant that we um, interact with, whether it's just whether it's the legal end, um, they do sign a le limited legal representation if the attorney is going to get involved. Um, but if it's just social service with Ava coordinating with them, every tenant receives education on, on their rights, on tenant rights, on landlord tenant laws. So, you know, we do a brief summary of, um, of that so that they know going forward and they can understand. Great, great. And Don, your program is a, a lot uh, shorter and kind of very much day of. So how is your conversation with tenants? Yeah, I really, I really commend the uh, Friends Association uh, uh, stepping, first off, just to step up to the plate and now to be so committed in what you're doing. Yeah, we, I, I don't see the docket sheet until we show up uh, for court. Uh, the notice, uh, the one difference with regard to the notice that we send out, it, it's going to the landlord as well. So in theory, both parties uh, should be aware that there'll be a lawyer present. Uh, I, and I'm the, uh, I, so I will meet with the tenant uh, as, and the uh, security person knows to refer all tenants first to me. And I, hopefully uh, they've got the complaint um, with them and the, and the lease with them. And so it allows me to, to review all that. If, uh, so I do a triage, if, if it's just non-payment of rent, um, I will um, explore, uh, you know, the reasons for the non-payment. Uh, uh, you know, more certainly with the, the pandemic, it's it's frequently associated with a loss of employment due to the uh, pandemic. And 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 if it's although then also if it's more than non-payment or rent, then we get into the viol uh, allegations of violation. Uh, what exactly? Uh, uh, is involved with that? Is it you think the trash situation was a criminal activity, uh, or in, in the term, at the end of the term of lease, uh, and and then having found finding out what the issues are, I'll then ask to meet with the landlord, and they're usually because, um, and this is this was a real wake up call for me. They frequently haven't talked uh, uh, until you know before even before the filing was done. Uh, and there's, there can be some animosity, usually some animosity here. Uh, but yeah, I'll meet with the landlord. If it's just non-payment of rent, uh, we've been successful in getting the, the landlord to agree to a continuance to allow completion of the application for rental assistance. Uh, so 
we don't have, uh, um, you know, I'm not dealing with a foundation at this point. I'm dealing with uh, the city of Reading, uh, who is the distributing uh, ERAP funds. And so there is a delay. Uh, right now, it's running about five to six weeks uh, following completion of the application and submission of everything that's required. Uh, so, but but then I, if the landlord is willing, then immediately the tenant will go to um, the intake person uh, from the city of Reading who's on site. And Judge Butler is very, very motivated to uh, continue the case. Uh, we even had a situation yesterday where um, it came in, it was a non-payment of rent situations only. And it was a tenant that had been living there for almost 20 years, but there had been a recent change in ownership. Uh, and and this, the new owner just was uh, irritated and disgusted that this tenant, it was always late. Uh, you know, he would pay $200 and then he would pay $500. The rent was only $700 a month. Um, but uh, uh, I met with the property manager. He said, well, to say, well, let's, he, he's, he's applying now. He didn't, he didn't, I think there's some issues with him, uh, you know, understanding what's involved. And he uh, failed to show up um, to, to a make application uh, before the hearing date. So even though the property manager had been very good about telling them about it. So the property manager got on the phone with the actual owner. He came back to me and said, no, the owner wants an eviction. So I went, we went before the judge and I made my plea and Judge Butler is very motivated uh, to help. And so she turned to the tenant and said, I'll give you one week. And we don't wanna hear any excuses now, but if you do the application and you have the application completed in one week, then I won't evict you. But if you come back here next Monday and you haven't done everything that you need to do, you're gonna be evicted. So she's great like that and, uh, in terms of motivating the tenant. Uh, um, so there is, uh, you know, there is work with, uh, I've had some success meeting with the landlords and working out an agreement. Unfortunately, I can't write checks that day and they have to be more patient. Uh, the five to six is actually, weeks right now is actually an, an improvement. Excellent. Excellent. So it sounds like, you know, whenever you're talking to tenants, you're never just talking to tenants. You really are working with the landlords as well. And it's very much a, a tandem and a group and collaborative process. Uh, one last question for anybody who is looking to start something like either one of your programs in their community. Who's the Who's the gatekeeper? Who's the person who has to say yes in order for, for this to happen? Who, who did you have to get approval from? Well, for us, it was the president judge of the Common Pleas Court. Um, but we also, before approaching him, um, found a champion among the courts. We had a magisterial district judge who had recently been elected to the Common Pleas Court. Um, so we we began the conversations with him and exploring information about Montgomery County's program, Philadelphia County's program, invited him to meetings. Uh, it really wasn't a tough sell because he had sat on the bench and, and saw what happened with evictions. So he really liaised with us, with the court, and then finding willing judges. Uh, Judge Voloki was uh, so open and willing and uh, gave us space within the court to set up a little office with a printer and to have private conversations. Um, the court staff are in the district courts are essential uh, because they're really, you know, a week ahead of time giving us the court list and giving us complaints and um, really facilitating our ability to do this well. So, uh, but ultimately it's up to the president judge. Well, with us, it's the same same situation. Uh, um, I had been, uh, well, when I was bar exec, I had observed the Montgomery County program, the EPIC program, and I, I really liked it. And, and, you know, having read Matthew Desmond's book, I was motivated to do, uh, to do something similar, but I wanted to wait until I retired so that before I asked anyone to walk the walk, I first wanted to be the one to walk the walk. Um, and then uh, with the pandemic hitting, um, 
I, I, the, the people of the Northeast Youth Development, Northeast Reading Youth Development Task Force reached out to me because they were concerned about student turnover rate in the city, completely in the city, but especially in Northeast Reading. And they were attributing a lot of that to um, the uh, eviction rate, uh, the high 80% eviction rate in the city. And so, um, and it just so happened that in the Northeast Reading, the magisterial district judge had just been recently elected, Judge Butler. She's a lawyer, she has a law degree. And, and so I first asked her, would you be willing, uh, because the task force was very motivated to do, uh, do what we were attempting to do in, re in replicating the uh, Montgomery County program. Uh, and she said, absolutely. Uh, she would very much like to be a part of it. And then I went to the president judge for, for his approval. Uh, but, but yeah, first uh, it, getting a, a judge that's committed and wants to cooperate and, and just as in Chester County, she arranges her schedule. So all the tenant cases are all in the same afternoon. It really does take a committed judge uh, in so many different ways. Uh, and, and then having a president judge who's willing uh, to uh, operate a, a pilot project like ours. Great, great. So I am going to uh, go ahead and turn to some of the questions from the audience. So, uh, one question we have is, you know, how do you work with, um, you know, those who are, are limited English speakers, right? So not only do you maybe have that, that kind of legally is knowledge barrier, but of course, you know, limited uh, language proficiency. So what are strategies in supporting those tenants? So we have bilingual staff. Um, in Spanish, but we have encountered other language. So we use a service called Boost Lingo, where you call in for translation. And then of course the courts are required to, uh, to supply interpreters for court hearings. Um, but we find that we need um, the translation services in advance as we're doing intakes and trying to assess the case um, and mediate with the landlord. So, but Boost Lingo has been our go-to thing. Yeah, the same here. There's a by um, Judge Butler has bilingual staff members, and so during the prep session um, that takes place right before the hearing, uh, we have access to her. Um, and then we've only, other than Spanish, I think we had one case where there was Chinese. And um, and yes, uh, we first uh, that was a case where the judge called in to take advantage of the the court certified interpreter, and then uh, had the call transferred to the conference room that she makes available for us. So that, that the language barrier is not a problem. Uh, sometimes there's an intellectual barrier that uh, can be difficult in, in many ways. Uh, so I, that's where it helps to have someone from the city of Reading. Uh, and our contact there who comes in is the uh, executive director of the Human Relations Commission. And she's very good. She has a social welfare background and she's very good with meeting with uh, those persons that have difficulty understanding what's going on. Great, great. Um, another question for both the panelists. Do you find that landlords are reluctant or unwilling to accept rental assistance, um, especially maybe a more permanent form like the housing choice voucher and working with housing authorities as a, a proposed resolution to the case? We have, not, done. <laughs> we have not had, the issue isn't so much whether they're willing to accept it, uh, they're willing to, to if it's just about money, they're willing to accept it if they're, if they're willing to wait the period of time because there is this delay that I've talked about. We have not, I, that's an interesting question about encouraging um, Section 8 vouchers, uh, the housing choice voucher. I would love to see more Section 8 housing in the city of Reading. There, there just is not enough. And, and, and frankly, I don't understand it uh, since it means it's a you know, a steady income each month. Uh, uh, and what's the price that the landlord has to pay is to maintain uh, the property. Well, don't you want to maintain your investment? So I, I really don't understand that. But that, no, if it's just a rental assistant issue, uh, that generally has not been an issue. But we're, we're seeing more and more now that it's, it's not just a, 
a rental assistance or rental non-payment of rent, but the landlord wants to sell. And this in today's market, they want to, and and he may already have a buyer lined up, and and the new and the new owner isn't, even though the new owner would have to accept the lease at least to the end of a term. Uh, it's uh, it's not necessarily a selling point. So that's that's become a bigger problem that they're even willing to forgo the back rent just to get the eviction taken care of. And and that's posed, we've been successful in some cases with negotiating no, and even in those situations. Just yesterday, um, we were able to negotiate that when pointing out some things about his lease. But um, uh, no, they if it's just about money, they'll, they're willing to take it. The, at least, you know, the ERAP money. Initially, there were so many restrictions with, uh, with the Pennsylvania funding that landlords weren't willing to sign up too easily for that. Yeah, we saw the same thing with the first round of ERAP in 2020. There were delays and restrictions. Um, I will say, and I'm glad you brought it up, yeah, we do, we do see quite a number of tenants with uh, a housing choice voucher. And so that's a data point that we are also collecting on because if a tenant is evicted with their voucher, they lose the voucher. Um, so we really are preventing the loss of that voucher um, many times. So most of the landlords are already working with the program. We did have a period of time for a couple of months where we had some emergency housing choice vouchers. So we were able to identify tenants uh, that also got rent relief that were able to apply. Actually, we had one this morning we got notified of that has been approved for uh, an emergency housing choice voucher. But the numbers were really limited. I think I, I forget if there were like 50 available. And of course, we had like 300 applications for them. So it was really, uh, you know, a difficult process to go through. Understandable. So we only have about three minutes left, but I do just want to put one last question of, you know, what does the future of your programs look like going forward in a minute or less? <laughs> well, I want to say we just were notified the United Way of Chester County has done a collective impact grant of $250,000 over three years for us because they believe in the project and expansion. And we are about to submit uh, the American Rescue Act grant to expand to all 16 courts. Um, so, you know, our goal is over the next year to have four teams going into the courts um, and uh, we're bringing on a housing and resource navigator just because, as Don mentioned, there are so many other issues related to um, how this happens. And so we want to be able to really coordinate community resources in a really intentional and meaningful way. So we're uh, small but mighty and looking to, you know, have this impact on every court in the county. I, I am so impressed with uh, you, Jennifer, and your organization. Thank you. uh, I, I am concerned about the future of our program. Our, our, our program in Judge Butler's courtroom is is uh, requires pro bono attorneys, and uh, and that's uh, it's been difficult to uh, recruit because I want one attorney helping me. I'm there every Monday afternoon, but I want somebody because of the caseload and the rapidity with which the hearings are held and the need for preparation. Uh, we 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 need a, two of us to be present. So uh, we're meeting with the bar association to try to develop and expand our pro bono program to take that into account. But, uh, but it's interesting, too, that United Way has been so impressed with the numbers that we've generated here uh, that, uh, you know, first they wanted me to <laughs> recruit more pro bono attorneys. And I said, and I said you're, you're asking a lot because uh, it's, for an attorney to give up in the afternoon is one thing. But most attorneys don't like to go into court unprepared. And frequently, we're not fully prepared when we have to go into a hearing because of the time that's allotted, uh, uh, you know, we, yesterday there were 12 hearings on the list and that's, you know, and over the span of uh, no more than three hours. And so she's, uh, you know, yes, there's some cases that get withdrawn. So not every, not every attorney is willing to practice on the fly like that. So what the United Way did was they just gave a grant to MidPen Legal Services uh, to uh, enough to pay for one attorney and then one navigator to be able to go into at least one other district court. And that's what we need. I mean, we need uh, a commitment and, and the, you know, the, um, 
the association and uh, the Friends Association in Chester County, it's, it's great to have a found, uh, your group uh, and then to receive a grant like that from the United Way in Chester County, that's just fantastic. And, 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 and we do have other foundations that might be willing to step up, but it all comes down to, unlike, um, you know, with, with Chester County, you hired a contract attorney to make life a little easier. And that's what we have to uh, think about in the future. But if I may just quickly think, there are three things I would love to see uh, happen statewide. And that is, we need to have a notice to defend, put, in this, uh, put with the notice of counsel so that Chester County doesn't have an issue as to, well, you're not allowed to send out notices ahead of time. Uh, we need to have notices go out like in Allegheny County at every stage of the process so that the tenant understands. We also need to have an amendment to the minor court rules that allow for a president judge to vary the procedure. Right now, the timeline as pointed out earlier is so tight. A hearing has to be held no later than, um, no sooner than seven days, but no later than 14 days. There's no chance to do a mediation. And, and yes, the first hearing could be continued, but too many of the MDJs just wanna push it. They don't wanna clutter their docket to continue a case. And then the other thing I would love to see in Pennsylvania is for the Supreme Court to do what the Delaware State Court Supreme Court did, and that is come out with a program referring to not allowing non-lawyers to represent tenants uh, after a training period. And then these qualified tenant advocates will be representing tenants at hearings. We need more representation so that we have due process in this important area of protecting housing, protecting people's roof over their head. I, I, you know, if we need to give more attention to this. Let's take advantage of this eviction crisis that occurred during the pandemic. That's my soapbox. Oh man, and you just uh, pretty much nailed it right on, on the head there. And I, I can't even think of a better note to end it on with you know the sort of what are the broader policy solutions that we can take from the amazing work that you are doing on the ground. So with that, I wanna thank you. I wanna thank everyone who joined the webinar today and put forth such uh, thoughtful questions. I know we didn't get to all of them, but we can definitely do some follow up afterwards. Uh, I do want to remind folks about uh, our voter engagement information session next week. And with that, uh, I want to say thank you and have a good afternoon. Thank you, Gail. Thank, thank you. you.